Hello, everyone. Welcome to Profusion 2021. Uh, I am now joined by John Banovich, who is a director, cinematographer, producer. He's got a lot of credits after his name. And uh, in this case, we are talking to him about wildlife photography using the Alpha One. Uh, welcome, John. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Thank you. And thank you, Sony, for having me. Total pleasure to be here. All right. And then some final notes for the audience. During the presentation, uh, you can jump into the Q&A, ask the questions, and I'll be able to read them, monitor them. And then I can ask uh, John those questions toward the end of his presentation. All right. Without further ado, John, carry on. Thank you. Uh, and welcome, everybody. Uh, this uh, is an example right here of what, uh, what type of work that I do uh, as a uh, natural history and wildlife uh, director, cinematographer, pro uh, producer, and photographer. Uh, I definitely do work mainstream as well as uh, a director and cinematographer on feature series and documentaries. But uh, my first love, my first passion uh, that I have been doing for more than 25 years is natural history. And Sony is a big part of that. Uh, that image there, of course, is a classic example of my arsenal. Uh, the, uh, the Venice, the FX9, um, the A7S Mark III, and uh, the Alpha 1. So the Alpha 1, uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the Alpha 1 and the A7S Mark III. Uh, they're both closely related. Um, some similarities, some differences. Uh, and I'm going to apply it to natural history. Uh, so some photography, some videography, uh, and we're going to get into that a little bit as well. Uh, from the standpoint of the Alpha One, I use it for both photography and cinematography. Uh, it's a dual purpose camera. It's a compatible system with uh, my, my Venice and my FX9. Uh, for a few reasons. So for example, uh, the camera does shoot S-Log3, which uh, in, in um, video mode, and that is a wonderful tool to have when I'm working with my Venice, my FX9, or uh, even in the old days, my F55. And it's, it's quite relevant because matching uh, the images after the fact in post, and for me, I use DaVinci Resolve, and being able to color grade uh, with some level of consistency, super important. And that's what S-Log3 is all about. So uh, that unto itself is a huge bonus because it gives me some compatibility between cameras. The uh, S-Cine Tone, another awesome feature. Again, working with the ELF cameras and the FX cameras. Uh, it's a quick way to, uh, to get the material out to post and deliverable very quickly, uh, not worrying a whole lot about color grading because it has a 709 type of look to it already. Uh, it again is a wonderful feature in terms of having multiple cameras or pulling sources from multiple cameras and uh, working with that in post because fairly predictable results. Uh, so that integration is, is uh, quite important to me. Um, the guys at Sony were hoping I'd tell you guys uh, that, you know, you folks out there a little bit about um, some stories of, of my uh, escapades, my adventures. So uh, this is some images of, uh, in two different locations of the, um, the 200 to 600 on the Alpha 1 uh, with the uh, Xperia uh, Pro on top using it as a monitor. And uh, the camera's actually set up on top of my, uh, my Forerunner on the rack. And the reason it is, uh, is for safety primarily. Um, I'm going to show you in a minute what I was photographing and filming. Um, this is another example of that same configuration uh, up in the Rocky Mountains uh, using the Xperia 1, uh, the Xperia Pro 1 uh, as, a, uh, as a monitoring device on the Alpha 1, uh, super handy phenomenal uh, combination and again you know being able to to work with a very light package uh, doing natural history one of the big concerns always is 
Uh, how much gear can I bring? How heavy is it? How much space does it take up? You know, can I fit it on a helicopter, a plane, a four by four, a quad, a canoe, a raft? Uh, and compromises have to be made. So the Venice doesn't always go. And the Alpha One uh, is a fantastic supplement for the Venice with, uh, as I said, pretty predictable results. That is why I was on top of the uh, on top of the uh, forerunner on that rack um, and it's a modified forerunner so it you know, big tires and all that wonderful off-road stuff uh, that's a 600 pound bore and uh, underneath that big mound of dirt and grass is his kill uh, an elk stag that uh, uh, he took down a couple of days earlier he's buried it and he's protecting it and um, uh, as much as you know you might consider that a smile, it's more of a growl. Uh, so for my own safety, uh, I'm on top of the truck. Long lenses are, are wonderful and definitely a requirement, but uh, you know, I'll take it a few steps further. And going back to the Alpha One uh, and the, the E-mount lenses, of course, you know, keeping a, a light nimble package is also important. So I'm photographing him and I'm filming him and I'm doing it uh, with the luxury of the Alpha One. I'm, I'm switching between modes. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about why I set the camera up a bit differently than, than other people might. Um, there's another one. He's, uh, you know, <laughs> he's pretty unhappy. Uh, not necessarily with me. There were wolves in the area that were, um, you know, threatening his, his uh, food source. So he was making it known that uh, they weren't welcome. And there, of course, he is eating a bit of his elk, uh, digging up part of the elk and uh, chewing away, I believe at that time, he was chewing away on the rib cage. And some cute little yearlings there, some grizzly bears playing in an open meadow. Um, same sort of thing. You know, if I'm down on the ground, mama's not gonna be too happy. Uh, and because the, um, the trough getting in there is quite low, uh, you can only four wheel in so far before they're going to hear you, they're going to see you, uh, you're no longer going to get these types of uh, images. So getting on top of the roof at this point uh, is a phenomenal vantage point uh, and opens up that opportunity to get these kinds of images. Um, that is springtime elk, it's a bull. And uh, you can see the, the, the fuzzy little short stubby uh, horns. You know, these angulates grow their, their horns back in the spring. Um, there's even a little bit of snow off in the tree line there. Um, so that uh, is another great example of the Alpha One working in some lower light conditions. The, there's just a subtle little reflection coming off of the atmosphere behind us before that the sun actually comes up. That's morning rise and it's giving that a little bit of a glow, that backlight, uh, you know, help to carry, create a, a separation. Uh, bull moose, again, springtime, stubby little horns. Uh, big boy, not something you want to contend with, uh, even in your vehicle. Uh, they, they get big, for sure. Uh, probably, and I can't quite remember, but I believe I'm in the, the wider end of the two to 600 on that one. Um, again, you know, Alpha One uh, cl overcast uh, cloudy morning and uh, running a higher ISO. Uh, yeah, I think it was 12,500 ISO. Um, springtime horns on this caribou. That's a northern caribou uh, along the forest line. Uh, same kind of conditions, uh, overcast. The, you know, and there, there's the old argument of, well, where do we put the light and where are the animals? And, and of course, there isn't always ideal uh, situations for photography. Um, and I do treat cinematography and photography different. I'm not always going to get necessarily the image I want with a photo that I will want to get with videography. So uh, in this case, the overcast is, is good in one respect that you're not getting the contrast. Uh, you're getting fairly even light. Um, you know, you'll notice in my photographs, like, careful about my background and what I'm going to use to help separate the animal or camouflage the animal, um, depending on, on uh, what the application is. 
So uh, overcast for me, at least anyways, can work. It can work to my advantage, uh, you know, both with cinematography and with photography. Uh, so in this case, I am working in another overcast day and uh, it, you know, it's helping me control those contrasts, definitely. Um, this is a, uh, a almost tundra. We're in uh, northern Yukon here. Um, these guys, I've, I've won a lot of awards for this particular image. Uh, just again, loving the way that the, the snow itself works as a giant reflector and it's giving me a bit of bounce. Um, the skies are lightly overcast. There is some blue poking through. So um, it's not as muted, not as soft. Uh, you know, and, and again, the snow helps to elevate that uh, light source slightly using it as a, a you know, natural reflection. Uh, getting uh, that separation. So that's the, um, that's the 600. That's the G Master 600 on the Alpha 1. And you can definitely see the lens compression there. There's, there's massive separation. Plus the forest is so far back. And then we've got some foreground as well. Uh, creating a you know very natural, believable environment. Like this one, kind of a cool moment. Um, call it the laughing fox. Uh, you know, one of the things about working with wildlife is you just never know. I always have a camera, uh, and 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 sometimes that camera is you know one of these, right? Uh, this is the Xperia One, uh, but you know. Uh, have a camera at all times because you just don't know. Uh, Alpha one, two to 600, uh, overcast skies. Uh, this little guy comes out and I'm actually facing the other way with my FX9 um, trying to uh, film grizzly bears. And this little guy comes out quite curious what, you know, what's going on. So uh, it's right there, uh, you know, parked beside me. I've got my Alpha one uh, with the two to 600 on it and uh, able to yank it out and capture this cool little moment. Um, a Grey Jay or Whiskey Jack, some people call them. Again, you know, what wonderful thing about wildlife is that uh, the animals are curious. Uh, certain species are gonna be a little more uh, inept to, uh, to explore and um, come and inquire. And uh, these guys typically run in, in pairs and couples. So, uh, you know, had a, had a visitor for a, a couple of minutes come by right beside me. And uh, again, same kind of situation. Uh, the Alpha One is close at hand. Uh, I think that's the 100 to 400. I'm almost positive, uh, you know, fairly close range. So, uh, you know, beautiful, beautiful lens compression there in the background. Uh, and, and again, separating our, um, our subject. So uh, a little bit of video. These are some samples from um, the Alpha One that I was uh, filming with. Um, that is a common loon on her nest uh, in some brutally windy conditions. Uh, and again, that's a, an example of uh, using the, um, the onboard autofocus to create a very natural rack focus. Uh, these guys are, are uh, grazing like crazy, springtime snow melt, and uh, you know, they're chomping away. You can see they're, they're molting, they're losing their uh, winter fur. Um, some samples of some higher frame rates, uh, 60 frames per second, 120 frames per second, uh, bald eagle, and uh, the eaglet here that uh, is getting fed some, uh, yeah, some fresh kill. Um, so mom is in there doing a little feed. Uh, this is 120 frames per second, a waterfall, windy day, just creating all this mist, blowing it up the mountainside. It was, uh, it was kind of cool watching the, uh, you know, the water actually being lifted as it fell. Um, again, really windy day. So stabilization is a, is a bit of a tricky thing. Um, quite often I build a tent around the camera, um, you know, my go-to is a couple of short uh, seat stands, lots of sandbags and a couple of flop uh, flags I can put together, you know, some four by fours, I uh, can put it together pretty quick. Um, so just giving you guys an example of some low light, uh, it's dark, it's dark out. There's a snowstorm, the sun's been down for an hour already. Uh, and then these two-year-old cubs come out to play in it. There's mama, she got to the 
you know, a ton of snow on her back. And uh, the Cubs come out to play in the snow. And, and you know, there, there were a couple of other wildlife photographers there and they've left already, they've gone. Um, neither one of them was using Sony and uh, you know, they're obviously deeming it too low for, uh, for them to get any light. And I stuck around, I stuck around for, um, for an extra hour uh, you know, hoping that, that these bears would come out. We had seen them earlier in the day, the mama and these, these two, two-year-old, uh, cubs. And, uh, we saw them earlier in the day. We, you know, we had got some images and, um, and some footage. And then of course that happens. It starts snowing like crazy. Uh, you know, everybody's, it's getting dark, everybody's leaving and uh, I'm there alone and they come out and they start playing in the snow. And, and that moment that, uh, I'm sure they, they wish they had you know, captured, um, they, they weren't able to. So uh, in that case, uh, running 12,500 ISO, uh, you know, one sixtieth of a second shutter. And uh, on the, um, the two to 600, uh, punched into 600. So a 6.3 wide open uh, and, and, you know, awesome opportunity. All right, um, I'm just keeping an eye on the time folks. So let's move into the A7S Mark III because for me, this is a, it is a fantastic complementary tool. Um, it supplements both the, the Alpha and the FX9 uh, and even the, the um, Venice for that matter. Uh, you know, it's a low light beast. And that's, that's its big, that's its big um, attraction. Um, and I use it for stills. Uh, you know, I know there has been some question marks as to uh, how clean are the still images. Uh, it's phenomenal. Uh, it's, it, it's definitely not giving me the same resolution that the Alpha One is in terms of rendering uh, in post, but uh, very usable images. Absolutely, uh, you know, print worthy for sure. Uh, S-Log, of course, very important. Uh, the s tone matching it to the FX series and the, the um, Alpha 1. Uh, also very, very, uh, you know, valuable uh, as an asset. Uh, in this particular case, I've got it in the uh, small rig frame with the, um, the Xperia uh, Pro 1, using it as a monitor. And that, uh, you know, the that short zoom, the 28 to uh, 1, to, uh, sorry, 24 to 128 um, is, is a, uh, a great interview lens, uh, my primary tool. So that bear we saw earlier, this is it with the A7S Mark III um, and, you know, clean image. Now I, I, I should point out that all of these images are color graded. They're down resed to, um, what are they down resed to? 1200 by 800, I believe it is. Um, and their JPEG compression. So, you know, obviously not as much information as the original, but it still gives you guys a pretty good idea of, um, of you know, what camera can accomplish and what that sensor can do for you. So uh, I'm a big fan of the Sony V90. Uh, for photography, there is a slight advantage as well as, as obviously for cinematography, the V90 allows the high frame rates, high data. But for uh, what I'm noticing, especially with the Alpha One, uh, you know, which can shoot 30 frames per second uh, as a standalone um, photography tool, uh, the V90 cards are fast. So I can do long bursts. In fact, you know, you could almost make it video if you wanted to, short video clips. But I do long bursts quite often uh, when you get into the action, right? Two grizzlies fighting or two elk, you know, uh, banging horns or uh, big horn sheep, uh, you know, and, and going at it uh, during the rut. Uh, I want to have that high frame rate, the highest speed possible. The V90 cards are, uh, are a valuable asset for sure. Um, there's that same bear. Uh, this is fairly early morning. Um, you can see just hints of reflected light uh, along the back of the, the bear, it, it, it really helps to define that grizzly's hump, you know, definitely no question that is a grizzly bear. Uh, and of course, you know, this is um, him, uh, you know, a, a head down, very threatening manner, growling at the, uh, uh, the wolves, making sure they know very clearly that uh, that pile underneath him there is his. 
The advantage, of course, for me is when he's busy with the uh, with the wolves, uh, you know, I get an opportunity to, um, I don't want to say get close because close is dangerous, but um, you just, just get a little more comfortable being in that zone. Um, this guy and I have known each other for a few years. Uh, we got a relationship going back uh, to, what was it, 2019, I think is when I first photographed him. Um, this is recent. The, the images I'm showing you and the clips I'm going to show you here in a minute are um, from just a few weeks ago. So right a few days before the big snowfall. Um, this is uh, a mother and cub from the spring. Um, that's a, a, a one-year-old and you know a yearling and uh, sun's going down. So this is sunset, a uh, nice golden light. light. And uh, again, having to live in the higher ISO range in order to compensate for the exposure, but the A7S Mark III does a good job of that. Um, cinnamon bear uh, under heavy overcast skies, got a break in the rain, everything's lush, it's wet, um, you know, creates a, a, a nice, uh, saturated look right in the camera, even in, in the raw mode. Um, and uh, a, a yellow uh, wobbler, um, kind of cool image in the sense that yes, it's raining, but uh, you know, and, and it gives it that nice punchy again, greens, low light, cloudy, but uh, the camouflage, the bird is able to blend into the background. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, and I just have to put this one in. These are two, three week old uh, grizzly cubs. There's three of them, uh, these triplets. And it just, you know, quite, quite cute. They, they had very little fear of me. Uh, in fact, I found myself backing up continuously. Mama was around, um, you know, she wasn't threatening in any way. Uh, you know, but again, just being respectful of their space and uh, not wanting to have any confrontation. I just kept my distance, kept backing up. Uh, that's the G Master 600 with 1.4 extender on it. Um, and, uh, you know, it rendered really nicely, uh, especially for, you know, what is what is daytime, right? There's there's a, an abundance of light. So it rendered really beautifully, quite happy with that. Um, I'm gonna show you guys a clip here. This is shot on the A7S Mark III. Um, and this is a Rocky Mountain Bighorn sheep who, uh, you know, this is, this is the uh, A7S Mark III on um, uh, a very lightweight tripod. And I've hiked up fairly high to, to get to this uh, location. Um, so I haven't graded it yet. I just want to give you guys an idea of, of, you know, what the material looks like coming out of the box. Um, shooting 120 frames per second. I notice it's a little jumpy. That might be my Wi-Fi uh, not playing it back smoothly. So I apologize. And certainly once we get this into um, uh, DaVinci Resolve or even the Sony Edit, um, uh, sorry, Capture, the Sony Capture, uh, you know, we have the ability to, to bring down those highlights uh on on the two uh, u's off to the left of frame there um so this male is uh going to <laughs> jump and it's he ends up not going very far uh, which i thought was kind of ironic because these guys can jump huge distances but it, just give you an idea again of of uh, the versatility of these cameras so you know where where um their their dual function um, and how they, they uh, complement each other. Um, this next clip is something I put together the night before. Uh, I did a presentation yesterday and I wanna use it again today because it's a, it's a great way to show you the Sony integration. Um, these, this material is shot on the Venice, the F55, the Alpha 1, the A7S Mark III. Um, it's a primarily E-mount uh, G and G-master lenses, but there is some P-mount lenses as well. Uh, I'm shooting with a base of 24P and 30P, but I'm also, you know, the higher frame rates. You'll see that here in a minute. Um, they were captured in a variety of uh, aspect ratios, 16 by 9, uh, 17 by 9, and uh, I use the 2.3. 3.9 on the Venice, uh, and, and that's another discussion, not for this workshop, but uh, the, um, the the combination of, of the different uh, aspect ratios, as well as a combination of XOCN with S-Log3 on my alpha cameras and my FX cameras. 
So on the Alpha 1, for example, uh, you know, pr I primarily shoot uh, S log 3. On the A7S Mark 3, I will do more of a combination of S City Tone and S log 3, depending on again what the, the final uh, product's used for. So with an interview, uh, you know. Fast turnaround, uh, something that I can light and control for the most part. And you'll see a couple of uh, interviews on this clip. Um, I will quite often just use that scene tone and if it needs any grading at all, it's very minimal. Um, the video is 1080, uh, we've, we've uh, compressed it down to 1080p and it is using the uh, H.264 compression. So uh, in order to, to be able to deliver it to you, um, Canada offers something very special and unique, our bears, from the Atlantic to the Pacific to the Arctic Sea. We have a very large range and variety of species, and it's important for us to understand how to coexist with these gentle beasts. I really appreciate that moment and regard that moment as, as a blessing to be able to uh, witness you know, a magnificent animal. You know, they don't have a lot of experience with bears and they want to get a great picture and they um, unknowingly put themselves at risk by trying to get close and, and in the end we can habituate those bears. With farmers or, or ranchers, uh, if there's, you know, grizzly bears in that area and you're checking the calves at you know, two, three, four in the morning, the risk is very much real to, you know, wander out and, and encounter a grizzly bear. So that kind of is where that hibernation and the need to gather calories um, starts to interact with people. So their drive is to really put on those fat stores. Working across silos and, and across agencies is really what we need for grizzly bear and, and black bear conservation, and especially in landscapes like we're in today. So, you know, we're talking about land that is um, owned uh, federally, provincially, by resource extraction companies, by cities, and, you know, and is traditional homelands of, of Indigenous peoples. Being bear smart, uh, being bear aware really does make a big difference. Um, when you're considering bear safety. So this is just a quick trailer. I put together of a documentary, a feature length documentary that I'm working on currently, um, The Gentle Beasts. And so this is an amalgamation of footage, as I mentioned, from several different sources. Um, it uh, was <laughs> engaging, exciting to say the least. I, uh, yeah, went through, as you can see from the different types of environments, uh, it was shot across Canada um, and almost every province and almost every territory. And with the work that I do, I have literally worked in every single province and territory and pretty much every season. Um, I typically uh, try to go in, you know, four wheel drive, uh, sort of modified four wheel drive vehicles, um, but I've, you know, used canoes, I've got a raft, uh, you know, drones, uh, you saw some drone shots there. So I am a RPAS pilot and I do take advantage of that as a tool, um, you know, got an ROV and I use uh, a variety of different tools to, um, you, you know, capture different perspectives. But, uh, you know, with the interviews, for example, there's a classic example where I'm using the Alpha One and the A7S at the same time. And one of the beautiful things about the, the Alpha One as well as the A7S is the, uh, the hot shoe, the digital hot shoe. So uh, I quite often, you'll notice that um, on one of the interviews, there is a lav, uh, the Sony diversity that I've, that I've had for um, a couple of years now. But uh, on other interviews, I'm using my primary mic, I'm using the Sony uh, B1M digital mic, uh, and you can make it very unidirectional. It does an amazing job. Uh, it's almost as good as my old QA75, which is a three foot long um, shotgun mic. It's almost that good. It's probably 90% of, yeah, uh, of what that mic can do in terms of you know, capturing um, audio from a long distance away. So it pairs beautifully with the, uh, the Alpha One. Uh, it, it's always on the Alpha One. 
always because I'm always trying to capture better audio and, and I don't always have a sound recordist with me. Um, and when we're working with bears, of course, the smaller the, uh, the crew, the, the safer it is. Uh, and, and I'm having both cameras is great because let's just say, for example, the A7S uh, Mark III is set up, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm filming something. Uh, and I forgot the, as I indicated, I, you know, quite often had the Alpha One uh, with another long telephoto lens on it. And, uh, you know, the, one of the G Master uh, 400, 600, uh, two to 600 or one to 400. And that'll be close at hand. And, and I can quickly pull out and snap off some still images of the action while the primary camera is, is filming it. Uh, so, uh, you know, work in combinations, always, uh, always have more than one camera with me uh you know the redundancy is great although it, you know someone might think well you know why do you you know need to have so many camera bodies um you know what if what if for example what if one fails but it's never happened to me so that's the the irony in all this is that i've never had any of these so so many cameras ever fail me um and you know they they get they get uh, exposed to some pretty intense uh weather conditions uh you know minus 45 minus 50 minus 55 uh, in the winter up in the Yukon Northwest Territories. Um, you know, on the, on the West Coast, some insane rain, um, fog uh, back east uh, on the prairies, you know, some hot, dry, deserty conditions uh, in amongst the hoodoos, rattlesnakes, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I don't know how well they're going to survive if they ever do, uh, you know, have to combat a, an angry grizzly bear or a uh, an upset moose, but definitely what I've put my Sony camera bodies through and lenses through, uh, I'm, you know, always amazed at how well they hold up the durability, reliability. So um, that is the end of my portion of the presentation. Um, I am uh, open to any questions or comments and thank you. Uh, yes, uh, you can uh, stop sharing your screen that way we'll go back in here there we go perfect so yes that was an amazing presentation i love the photography that's amazing um one of the things that immediately and i guess the little video clip that you just uh, uh shared talked a little bit about that safety uh, around the bears and so that was like one of my first questions how far is safe enough uh you mentioned that um you know as as even the little cub starts approaching you and you back up what is that safe distance that you feel uh, you know is comfortable? Yeah, it, it, great question. Uh, the federal government uh, guidelines, uh, based on Park Canada's recommendations, is 100 meters. Uh, that's pretty tough. At 100 meters, even on a you know a, a 600 with a 1.4, you're still a ways away. So for me, a big part of it is just having years and years of experience studying biology, wildlife biology, and and having years and years of experience working around these animals and beginning to understand uh, their, you know, reading the science, right? Knowing not every bear is gonna respond the same way. That boar, for example, you know, we got a three-year relationship. Uh, he definitely knows who I am. You know, I make sure he listens to me and, and hears my voice. Um, my attitude around him is really important. Uh, also, you know, uh, it, you, most human beings, as we should be, you know, we're apprehensive when we approach a big animal like that. And knowing that they're four or five times as fast as, fast as a human can run. Uh, also, you know, their ability to drop you to the ground just by sheer weight and force and those, you know, claws and those teeth, uh, they're, they're, you know, uh, they eat meat, right? They're, they're omnivores, but they're, they're, they're set up to, to pierce the, the hide and to extract the meat. So, um, that, that's really, I think, important too. Grizzly bears, uh, a different, you know, and that's what we're going to cover in this documentary, by the way. Uh, grizzly bear, uh, the approach with grizzly bears is, for me at least anyways, different than it would be for black bear slash commodity slash cinnamon bear. And different again from polar bear. So every bear, my experience has been that every bear, uh, I engage differently, every species, sorry, of bear, I engage differently. But also within the, the species and the subspecies of each category, uh, I approach every bear differently. Because just like you and I, um, two different people, yeah, we're both people, but two different people, um, you know, I can have a bad day and I might be a little cranky today. So, uh, whereas you may not be cranky today. Uh, and, and bears are the same way, you know, 
that bear today might be cranky tomorrow and he can just be Mr. Mellow. So, you know, that, that is also a big part of being aware and staying alive. And when you go to a location like that, obviously there's some uh, instances where you have to trek quite a ways. Um, do you already have in mind, I'm going to bring these lenses specifically? And then a follow-up to that question was, do you pick your spots considering the background, considering the light that's coming in on that particular day? So are you hoping that in this general direction, the animals will pass through that area and that just comes with experience of knowing their patterns? So absolutely right. Uh, quite often I'll do a, a bit of a scout. So the first day out is a bit of an experimentation, trying to understand the animal patterns and trying to understand their behavior. Uh, wildlife is exactly that. There's, there's, they're unpredictable. Um, unlike directing in, you know, actors on a movie set where I can say, you know, the, the uh, first assistant director can say back to first marks and they go back to first marks, we do it again and we tweak it. That's never going to happen with wildlife. Uh, it just doesn't. So you have to be ready for, you know, what they're potentially going to do. Uh, and the more time you spend with them, the more you understand their behavior and each bear specifically, uh, you know, three days versus three weeks, you're going to get different results over three weeks than you will over three days. Now, um, my, you know, I don't have that luxury all the time of, of having that much time. Uh, quite often the budgets aren't there to support that. So, uh, you know, you get what you can within the context of, of limitation of time and resources. And as we move into uh, the fall and winter, like was the case here, uh, my, my daylight hours are very short. So, uh, you know, you're, and you're right, you, you're choosing lenses based on weight size, but you're also choosing lenses based on performance. So, you know, obviously a 2.8 is gonna be a whole lot more valuable at the beginning of the day and the end of the day uh, than a 6.3. Um, however, you know, there's really nothing out there that's a 2.8 at a 600. Uh, Sony, if you're listening, just a suggestion. Um, uh, but yeah, no, no, I, 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 I don't think the physics behind it, it's even possible, but, uh, th that, that is where some of the choices come in. How many batteries am I dragging along? Um, you know, what am I bringing bear spray versus water versus food? You know, what kind of food am I bringing? What kind of food will, will attract uh, animals? Um, even the, like it was mentioning earlier, the camera body, right? Uh, what the A7S can do. Uh, versus what the Alpha One can do. And both cameras have very distinct characteristics and are, are, are excellent cameras, but they do offer slightly different and complementary uh, features, right? So th that's a huge part of it for sure. And then uh, one of the questions that did come in is, uh, do you use a teleconverter with the 200 to 600? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, I, I am reluctant to do that. Um, sure, the 200, 600 is smaller. Um, it's not really lighter than the 600. Uh, you know, there's a lot more glass in that lens because it is a zoom lens, uh, but it is shorter. That's one of the advantages, uh, but it is a 6.3 at the long end. So bear that in mind when you're adding the 1.4, uh, you know, you're losing light. Uh, if you're shooting with the A7S Mark III and you, you know, want to play in the higher ISOs, uh, with you know uh, lower noise ratios, then then that that's definitely a possibility. Um, I go you know I'm an old school cinematographer. Uh, I go back 25 30 years ago, and so my rule of thumb is always if, if I can avoid putting a teleconverter on, which will distort the image on a zoom lens, which is already going to have uh, some level of um, disparity because of all the elements in the, in the lens, uh, the additional elements, then um, I'm gonna try to avoid that. I'll try to go with the prime with a teleconverter, uh, just to try to keep the image as clean as I can. Also targeting is another big part of it. You know, how does it target to the sensor? That's a, you know, that back focus um, is a really big concern. Mm -hmm. So it's a little more challenging with a zoom. Uh, yes, I have used my 1.4 with a two to 400. I, I have, uh, especially for the videography side of it. And sometimes you have no choice. You know, uh, I'm getting on a little tiny Cessna and I've got to put sound guy and a camera system in there and our safety gear and, and food and water and, and we just have to make compromises. Um, and, and that's what it is. So uh, 
that's you know my my personal experience and then for lenses as well there's always been this question of the 100 to 400 g master versus this newer 200 to 600 uh do you just factor in oh well the 200 to 600 has more reach or do you kind of do a comparison between those two a lot of wildlife photographers that are kind of starting out that's their question uh to to retail staff is which should i go with yeah and, and the 100 400 i'll tell you um what i do like about it is it's compact it folds down right you snap it in you fold it down you pack it up uh it's in your side pouch it's in your backpack it weighs a lot less but most importantly it takes up no space so uh if i'm hiking if i'm going on that hike uh and and i'm going up high uh and you know i want to lighten the load as much as i can uh, you're going to have to bring water. There's no question about it. Uh, don't ever, you know, on, on a hike like that, especially don't ever think that you're going to leave without water. I mean, yeah, I, I, you know, I can bring a little filter with me. Um, I can drain water from a stream up there, uh, assuming that, you know, there's a melt and, and that we do have water up there. So, you know, knowing a little bit about the environment you're going in every time uh, is critical to your survival. I mean, that, that's paramount. I can't stress that enough you know, don't even worry about the lens and the camera if you're not prepared to survive in that environment. Um, it, you know, I've been close a few times, but I'm still here. So uh, the 100 to 400 will always be my choice for, you know, the absolute slim down minimalistic type of package, because it does give the results. Um, and it doesn't have quite the same reach. But you know, that's where I might be inclined. And I have brought the 1.4 along, right? So I slap that on there and I'm, I'm, you know, not quite the same lens, but definitely able to live in that area and that range, uh, that focal length range. But I've got a very small compact lens and it, it, it comes down to compromise really. And in the 400, 400 is a great lens to start with if you're getting into, uh, you, you know, localized, if you're not ready to do those crazy trips, into the bush quite yet and you're just starting out uh, doing natural history and wildlife um it's a fantastic lens to have you know in the sort of um urban setting or even in the suburban setting uh again it takes up so little space it's you know saving a few dollars uh you know work your way into the 200 to 600 eventually and you know why invest in something that you may not necessarily going to need initially that that's the other big question uh but you know, then eventually what you'll end up with is a 200 to 600 and a 100 to 400. And, you know, as most wildlife photographers will tell you, you know, you're going to have that R3 or that R4 in your kit along with your Alpha 1. You will. I mean, you know, you're smiling because I know you do it too. <laughs> we all do. Um, you know, and, and eventually you you end up with your own inventory. Uh, you know, you're, you're effectively a, a, a mobile uh, store. You know, you've got enough hardware there. Uh, and, and that lens will definitely always be part of your kit. You will always use it. You, you know, it's a good investment. Wow. Um, and then another question that comes up is about autofocus. Um, are you using wide autofocus spot? Are you using zone? Uh, and obviously with the alpha one, you have the animal eye detect as well. Do you use that, uh, for, for subjects like the bears? Absolutely. And the animal eye detect uh, in the video mode is fantastic. Uh, you know, my Venice does not have it. So uh, it, it's a little more work with the Venice because you're always pulling focus, always trying to pull focus uh, detail, you know, and creating that 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 edge uh, on the, um, uh, the, the focus edge on the, uh, uh, you know, the assist on the Venice uh, is is paramount where I can be a little more lazy with the Alpha One. I hate to say that, but, um, you know, hey, hi, BBC, National Geographic, you didn't hear that. Um, uh, I, I work hard and yeah, it's always on the lens, always and my camera assistant to his best folks puller in the business. Um, uh, that's what they want to hear. So yeah, the autofocus, uh, it, it, how I set the autofocus is relative to the subject, right? That That's tricky. I mean, behind me, here's kind of a cool image. I put that up because that's, uh, on the R Mark IV, um, so it's not an Alpha One, but it's kind of a cool moment because that was four nights driving out there waiting for this to happen. It was either too cloudy or the moon was in the wrong spot. That's a full moon rising with the Northern Lights on the other side over top of the lake. 
uh, and it, you know, we're minus 25, there's a thin layer of ice on this lake. It gets a little muddy off to the west side of the lake there, but um, sitting out there, you know, freezing my butt off, uh, trying to keep the camera warm because that's what it comes down to, right? It comes down to, uh, and, and focusing on stars is always a little bit more of a challenge, but uh, you know, that's what it comes down to is perseverance, uh, you know, the camera, if I'm cold, oh well, uh, if the lens freezes up, bad. If the camera dies, bad. No, no, can't have that. So, you know, uh, you know, fingers sometimes get a little uh, frozen up. Um, toes get frozen up, for sure. Uh, hopefully, you know, you got a warm vehicle or a campfire or something, a tent, warm tent close by. Um, but yes, uh, autofocus, it, it's relative to the subject. And I, I had a clip in there earlier where I was showing how I use the autofocus of the um, Alpha One to create a very natural, I, I, you know, I'll set the speed of the autofocus because you can control it. The Alpha One's awesome that way. And I can create a very natural rack focus. Uh, I love that. Um, and having that foreground, you, you're creating very cinematic movement there with the pan, with the focus, um, pulling off of something, you know, get a great little edit, a cutaway. Uh, to that subject, uh, you know, and, and you can do that now without the assistance of any crew, you can do it all yourself. Um, so, you know, hats off to Sony for, I mean, it's just, a, it, it's a massive step forward, right? It, and it's so, the, the technology is so innovative, uh, it, it opens up the door for creativity. So in that case, I'm setting my autofocus to wide, but narrow. So I'm using the, the, the narrow air, uh, uh, autofocus and I'm eliminating the top and bottom of my frame using the, the middle only, but it's wide so that I can come off of that subject off the tree onto, sorry, coming off the, 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 the little bush there, the little tree and onto my subject and it, it, you know, setting the speed and then it creates that beautiful movement. The, the one thing that I can say, it doesn't always work, right? I mean, and it doesn't matter how long you've been doing this, not every image is gonna be perfect. Um, and the autofocus is again, just a tool. If, if you don't know how to manually focus, that's the most important thing. Sometimes I'll override the autofocus and I'll just grab the barrel and, and pull it myself because it's not performing the way I want it to. So uh, they're all tools but it requires time and familiarity with it. Uh, it. It requires knowing your your menus. You know, I, I mentioned this earlier too, setting up my menus, a lot of uh, professionals have uh, the, the custom keys and the, and the quick functions. Um, and that only works from my experience if you know exactly where everything is and you train with it. You literally train with it, uh, you know, no different than, you know, a driver training or someone at the range, you know, training with their firearm. It's just, it's, it, you have to train with it to know where all the buttons are and become proficient with it. Uh, you know, and a lot of times that particular function that you want isn't what you've programmed into your, your custom settings. So uh, then you're burying yourself in the menu. So uh, my advice with, and, and the new menu system, by the way, is, is phenomenal. Uh, they've, they've improved it. Uh, dramatically, uh, Sony's done, a, a, again, an amazing job of that. Um, but familiarizing, familiarizing yourself with the, the menus is critical. Uh, for me, that's first and foremost. And then I worry about the custom keys, and then I worry about the, 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 you know, the hot buttons. Um, but until I know that menu well, I'm hooped because you can't put everything in, and then, and then it's okay, hang on, wait a minute, push this. Okay, where's C1 again? Okay, C, C3, okay, it's down here. Oh yeah, hang on, wait a minute. I changed the center of that. Uh, the center button isn't re return anymore, you know, and, and so you, you can actually make mistakes uh, if you forget how you've set it up. Um, you know, what I try to do, especially on the Alpha One is set it and leave it. If I keep changing it and trying to, you know, oh, this guy does that, you know, you know, John does this or, or Greg does this or whatever, you know, um, you know, uh, Karen does that and, and, and I'm going to try it because that looks really cool and that, that's a great idea. And then you'll make the mistake of going out there with someone else's presets now and you know, now you have to relearn it. Wow. Well, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and your experience with us. Um, again, I love I love looking at your work, especially uh, bears. That's just for me awesome. I can't wait to shoot my first grizzly in a fashion shoot coming forward. I guess, but uh, <laughs> thanks again for joining us uh, here at Profusion and sharing the amazing work that you do. 
And uh, for the rest, uh, again, this was a, a wealth of knowledge that you got here. And I wanna thank you, uh, John, for uh, participating and coming out to this uh, event with Sony. Well, thank you very much everyone for having me and, and thank you for Sony for uh, sponsoring this. It's fantastic, absolutely. Absolutely. Good luck everybody. All right, well, anyway, continue enjoying your day here at Profusion 2021. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>